know why we're here. We're here to see Liz do her present her TO3, and this really is a fascinating topic. And again, it just shows too that in our institute, uh, the breadth of topics we're covering is, is um, amazing. So I'll hand it over to Liz. Thank you, Anthony. So, thank you for being here today. I'm Liz Davies, and as Anthony said, this is my confirmation of candidature. Um, I will start with the title, which you can all read anyway, but it's called In the Loop, Identifying and Responding to the Psychosocial Support Needs of Children and Young People When a Loved One is Missing. I start by describing myself as a practitioner researcher. I work in a unit, I coordinate a unit that <coughs> responds to children and young people, that supports family members and friends when a loved one is missing. Please come in and, and sit down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you support young people when someone they care about goes missing? That young person might be uh, attempting to cope with um, having a parent, a sibling, a more extended family member, a family member from a more extended relationship or a, a, a kinship relationship, but somebody they care about is missing. Um, Michael, the cameraman, said to me, and I said I'd quote him, I don't know whether I've just demoted you by calling you a cameraman. <laughs> um, the IT specialist <laughs> talked about we see families when someone is missing often for a couple of short moments and the moments are around them being upset but we very often don't see them after that time. So what happens for families? And more specifically, what happens for young people? I said I'm a practitioner researcher and for the more than 30 years I'm actually what's called an accredited mental health social worker and most people don't know what that is. But for more than 30 years I've worked with people who are experiencing some form of loss or trauma or a combination of both. I see people in private practice outside of my work at Attorney General's which is where my unit sits. I see people in private practice and in all that time I came across two family members who said to me there's someone missing in my family. And I think, is that because it happens so little? And I know the answer to that is no. Is that because it doesn't impact people significant, significantly? And I know the answer to that is no. Or is there something else that means that people are not recognised, and specifically young people are not recognised? as impacted as part of the family system when somebody goes missing. So there is no research that specifically addresses the impact on and response to young people impacted by the loss of a missing person. There is only limited research that specifically addresses the impact on young people of other types of ambiguous loss and I'll explain um, in a couple of slides what I mean by ambiguous loss. But when it comes to young people living with missing, there is no research that specifically addresses their situation. So these are the words of a young person and this is a young person who came into contact with Families and Friends of Missing Persons Unit and I'll refer to Families and Friends of Missing Persons Unit as FFMPU, which is the acronym. When my dad went missing, I didn't know at first. Mum and Dad's brother went to the police station to make a missing persons report. They didn't tell me until he'd been missing for about two weeks. And one of my questions, and I know the answer to this, but one of my questions is how come they didn't tell her? I really want to know what's going on but I'm not sure of what they're telling me and what they're not. And we know that if you leave children out of a situation that they're aware of, 
they sometimes stop asking or they sometimes they wonder what's happening who do they trust who do they ask so some more information about missing more than 35,000 people a year are reported missing in Australia uh, New South Wales has the highest proportion of missing persons reports in the country, probably because we're also the most populous state. 95% of people reported missing return within the first week and 98% return within six months. A small percentage, 1% to 2% remain missing and they remain missing long term. Um, in Australia, there's very approximately 1,600 long-term missing people in Australia, but in fact, we don't know how many long-term missing people there are. New South Wales, again, has more than a third of those long-term missing people. Research, and it's research that's um, from 2008, says that when one person is reported missing, 12 people on average are affected in some way. And you've only got to look at the media when you see reports about missing people to see the impetus that can um, be generated for high profile missing persons matters. But the other side of that is that if there are more than 1,600 long term missing, you could probably name one or two. What about the other 1,598? Um, long-term missing people in Australia. So the intention of this research is not to identify the number of young people who are affected. Um, I looked up Boxar and it said that under 20 years of age in Australia, uh, the population of young people under 20 years of age is 22% of our population. No way do we see 22% of our client base as young people. So, so the aim of this research is to draw attention and raise awareness that in fact young people are affected when a loved one goes missing. Okay. I mentioned FFMPU, Families and Friends of Missing Persons Unit. So we're part of Victim Services, we're part of Department of Justice, New South Wales. We're funded by Department of Justice. We also happen to be the only unit in Australia that works specifically with the families of missing people. There isn't another unit that does this and in fact there's not another unit funded by government in the world that works specifically with the families of missing people. We provide support, we are a team of social workers and psychologists. We provide support to people of all ages and that's face to face, via phone, email, Skype and social media because obviously not everybody is you know, accessible to our service, can access our service. Through counselling, support group meetings and missing persons events. We also produce a range of publications, community education and we're involved in research. This is my research. As I said, we're funded by government and I happen to be the coordinator of FFMPU. So I'll talk a bit about the terminology because I think we don't talk about missing every day and, and I think the terminology is often, um, let me think of a word, but the terminology is ambiguous. What do we mean when we talk about missing? When I use the term missing and I know Anthony commented that, um, that the use of the term was ambiguous. In fact, missing is a noun, a verb and an adjective. So I talk about living with missing and the impact of it. I talk about someone being missing. I talk about a missing person. But I'm talking about both the event of going missing and everything that follows afterwards when I say somebody lives with missing. The research involves children and young people. So I talk about child or young person and I'm talking about um, under 18 years of age. I use more often the term young person or young people because most young people don't like to be referred to as children. They, they would prefer to be referred to as young people. They can call themselves that, but again, language I think is really powerful and important, so they call themselves young people. 
the missing person is someone whose whereabouts are unknown and there are concerns for their safety or welfare. Family is, as I said before, any relation to the person, those who are left behind. Uh, family is uh, parent, sibling, uncle, aunt, or a kinship relationship. Somebody who is important to the young person. The loved one is the missing person. And they're almost the choice of terms you've got. Do I talk about my relative as a missing person or do I talk about my loved one? Um, so that, that's when I'm talking about a loved one, I'm talking about the missing person. Ambiguous loss is uh, the theory that underpins this research. And the chief, the principal theorist of ambiguous loss is uh, Professor Pauline Boss, who lives in the States and who really is the person who has written most about and researched ambiguous loss. When we talk about ambiguous loss, I'm talking about missing and I'm talking about physically absent and psychologically present. So when somebody goes missing, they're physically gone, but psychologically they remain very much a part of the family. When their whereabouts, their fate, their, their circumstances are unknown. Pauline Boss started writing about ambiguous loss in relation to soldiers returning from the Vietnam War because she spoke about people who were physically present and quite psychologically absent at times, which is the impact of trauma, much more than trauma, but the impact of trauma. So again, two types of ambiguous loss. One is physically present, psychologically absent, and the other is psychologically present, physically absent, and that's missing. Um, there are others that fit into that, and that can be adoption. It can be the loss of a child at a very early age where the child remains very much psychologically present but physically absent. Finally, we talk about disenfranchised grief. Um, and the principal theorist for this is also from the States and a fellow by the name of Ken Doker. Um, children are disenfranchised when somebody's missing because their situation is not recognised. They can be disenfranchised. Quite often, their capacity to understand, to be impacted, or to grieve what has happened is either underestimated or it's just not recognised because you hear things like they're too young to understand. We won't tell her because she won't cope with it. But in fact, what they're denied is a part in what is happening. Okay. Missing is a combination of all of those things, trauma, loss and grief. It causes personal and social upheaval and disruption. It impacts every part of somebody's life. Um, in terms of the personal impacts, we're talking about, I'm talking about disbelief, shock, fear, anger, feeling overwhelmed, not knowing where to turn for support and often not being recognised when people do. When they reach out for help, people try to fix them try to fix the situation. Missing very often can't be fixed. Anxiety, sadness, depression. In terms of the social impact, it leads to conflict in relationships because people can be, can make a very different meaning, can have a very different understanding or um, opinion about what has happened or why something has happened, why somebody's gone missing. Um, it often attracts really negative comments and that whole, people are very judgmental when it comes to what has happened in a family when somebody is missing. Why has somebody gone missing? Um, the other day I was at a meeting and I heard somebody talking about legitimate missing persons, which I think is a pretty negative comment. And in the end I said, we really need to be mindful of our language, which is why I talked about the terminology, because what's a legitimate missing person? Um, I think what they meant was somebody who's bundled into a, the boot of a car and leaves a trail of blood. That's a legitimate missing person. Rather than somebody who literally is one of our family members speaks about disappeared into the ether. No preparation, no warning, n nothing that indicates where that person has gone. 
And that's the missing we very often work with at FFMPU. Um, the world stops being a safe place if part of your family, family, when their whereabouts is unknown, when their fate is unknown. So it leads to isolation and it leads to financial impacts. How do you continue to do what you've done every day when you live with an ongoing loss and trauma? So for young people, they may not feel directly the same financial impacts, but they're still expected to get through life and do all the other things that are part of everyday life. The complicating factor is not knowing, is the ambiguity. And, and Pauline Boss talks about ambiguity being the culprit in the room, that it is the not knowing that is difficult. There is a lack of resolution and there is no closure. And really when you look at social media, you look at comment, commentary about missing. People talk about achieving closure. And in fact, closure, I believe, is almost impossible. The other comment that family members very often make is that it's a roller coaster. All these emotions continue to impact on people and on families. So this is actually the parent who, whose quote I put up earlier. My poor Lil, L, is in a terrible state, as am I. I really don't know where to start, but I think talking to someone would be really great. She wants to come as well. I'm not worried about her having the day off, and she means the day off school, as Elle feels it would be good too. She's so upset, as you can imagine, and I think we're all in a very emotional state. Now, this is 2012. This family lived through that um, experience of missing for years after that. So for parents and carers, in families everyone is affected. It's not about age or maturity or intellectual capacity. Everyone is impacted in a family. So age or youth does not preclude those left behind from being affected. The challenge for parents can be of finding ways to manage their own feelings of distress while supporting those around them. I can remember one family member saying, I'm only going to tell her the facts because there's no point telling her anything else. So what do you do when there are no facts? What do you do when you have no information? And they're the issues that confront family members and confront parents and carers. Everyone experiences some degree of difficulty with a loss that is ambiguous and it's difficult to explain or to understand a loss that remains unclear. One parent actually said, how do I explain it when there are more questions than answers, when I don't have the answers? And as parents or adults, we often expect that we're able to answer our children's questions. We're able to answer young people's questions. We're able to find solutions, and yet solutions don't present themselves in this situation. Okay, I didn't know how to tell her. I kept thinking there's no good way to tell her and I worried about how it would affect her. I just hoped he'd be back before we needed to say anything. I hate to see her so upset and very often that's what people hope. I'll just postpone it because he'll be back. He'll be back tomorrow, he'll be back the next day or she'll be back, it'll all be okay, we'll know what's happened. But the reality is for that 650 in New South Wales, that's 1600 in Australia, that doesn't happen. So if you wait till the person's back, you could wait for a very long time. Okay, when someone goes missing, everyone thinks about the adults and they think the kids are too young to understand. So within the literature, within the research and within the unit for which I work, young people are seldom referred to or in fact referred for support. And yet the need for support when a loss is ambiguous is recognised. Pauline Boss says, people need assistance to get through something like this. There are differing opinions about both the place of young people and the need for information when a traumatic event has occurred. When the event is characterised by ambiguity, such as missing, then those opinions and positions of parents and carers become more divergent. And everybody has an opinion about how it should be done. 
but the reality is that very often it's not done. They're not told. Um, so children are thought to be too young to understand or to hear about traumatic events. Um, people fear harming them psychologically. If I tell him this, what will it do? Well, my response to that would be, very gently, if you don't tell him, what will it do? Stereotypes exist about kids being tough and bouncing back, and we hear that again. You know, they're okay, they'll get through this. And yet we see adults who struggle. So I feel that exactly the same, I know that exactly the same happens for young people. Um, so, if, so if they're the prevailing beliefs, once again their support needs, the impact on them is disenfranchised. Their needs aren't recognised. Young people express the desire to be kept in the loop. We want to know. We want to know what's going on. We want to be told. Tell us what you know. Don't leave us in the dark. They're often aware of what's happening or that something is happening even when they're silent. And, it, and for any of you who work with children, you will become aware that they often don't articulate what's going on, but they're quite perceptive about what's happening around them. Okay. In terms of previous research, there are two sides to it. One is around the missing persons population, and the, and the other part is the left behind population. So the families who are left behind when someone goes missing. For the first part, the first side, the missing persons population, the focus has been around counting it, working out why people go missing, where people go, um, when they return, how often they return. So it's, it's very um, much a quantifiable, difficult but a quantifiable um, part of the research. The, and search outcomes are what people focus on, what the media focuses on are search outcomes. Um, the left behind population is the other side and the two dot points at the bottom of the page are where the research currently sits and that is the experience of adults impacted by missing but usually significant events like um, those who remain missing after 9-11. There's research around the impact on those people but it's very much a clearly identified significant event. Um, the other research is around young people living with ambiguous losses other than missing. So people se young people <coughs> separated by war, military conflict, uh, young people living in out of home care. That's the ambiguous loss research that does uh, pertain to young people. So why is research needed? Young people are overlooked, they're forgotten in the existing research. There is no research that specifically addresses the impact on the on and response to young people impacted by the loss of a missing person. And there's only limited research that specifically addresses the impact on young people of other types of ambiguous loss. And whilst some of it can be extrapolated, I want to know what's happening specifically with young people who live with the loss of a missing person, someone they care about. I've adopted a qualitative approach. Why? Because it's little understood and it can't be quantified. Um, the impact cannot be quantified. The topic is one that is emotional, it's uncomfortable, it's quite confronting to work with people where you cannot give them answers, to ask them questions about what it's like to live with not knowing. Um, so it requires a level of sensitivity that I think um, it's, it's really important. It lacks sufficient, it cannot be sufficiently explained using quantitative methods. You cannot get the rich description of personal individual experiences through quantitative me measures, um, so it can't be explained thoroughly. My qualitative approach allows for that rich description. It allows young people, it allows parents and carers to talk about what it's like to support young people, what the challenges are in their own words. The other thing is, and I've probably put it a little bit bluntly, the sample size is small. It's difficult to identify them. 
So I really want to get a rich description from those who become part of this research. Okay. The aims of my research, to explore and identify the experiences of and impacts on children and young people when a loved one is missing. To develop and promote an understanding of the experience of children and young people. So this includes an understanding of the impact of missing on them. Their psychosocial support needs and the way these support needs are both acknowledged and responded to by parents, carers and service providers. Okay, the aims continued to identify best practice in responding to the psychosocial support needs of children and young people and the parents and carers who support them to live with missing. And finally, to develop guidelines for working with children and young people and their parents and carers who live with missing. I realise how often I say missing. I do. So, study one. I'm going to research the experience of children and young people. I'm going to use in-depth, semi-structured interviews, inviting, asking young people to tell their story about their experience. I'm going to talk to five children and young people, so up to the age of 18 years. And then I'm also going to talk to five adults who were young, under 18 years, when a loved one went missing. Because if there are 1,600 long-term missing people in Australia, there are still plenty of people who have lived with missing for a long time, who've lived with it since they were children. In study two, I intend to research the experience of parents and carers of young people. I'm going to use a focus group of 10 parents and carers to elicit this information about their experience, what it's like for them to support a young person living with missing. I'm going to ask them about their information and support needs, what they need to be able to respond to the young person they care for, so that what they need to enable them to support their young person. In study three, identifying best practice and developing guidelines for responding to young people, I'm going to use the information I obtain in studies one and two because I actually hope that what I get from those young people and from their parents and carers is a really rich description of their experience. Um, I also intend to use an online survey of service providers who identifies having contact with families including, that include young people living with missing. Service providers will be identified by the young people, but it will also be, but they'll also be drawn from the FFMPU, Families and Friends of Missing Persons Unit, interagency database. And the anticipated outcomes, a voice for young people, a voice to be heard and to explain their experience of the loss of a missing person, to raise awareness that young people are impacted too when a loved one is missing, to increase understanding of the psychosocial support needs of young people, to increase understanding of the needs and challenges for parents and carers, because there are many, and develop guidelines to improve the response to and support for young people and their families. And that's me. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Interesting presentation. Shall we open it up to questions from everyone? Shy. <laughs> was it because it was dull? <laughs> Very interesting, very interesting and very, very, uh, yeah, very challenging topic because you, you don't easily get the sample, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have a question, Liz. Uh, you, your title is Identifying and Responding to the Psychosocial Support Needs of Children. Now, I'm wondering, in your three studies, are you going to also identify and 
uh, to see what is happening in missing practices. Not just missing people. It's missing practices like psychosocially benefiting practices uh, that are not physically present in the present um, interventions that your unit or other units are doing and things that are happening in the units in the sense that they should be beneficial to the people but they are not that beneficial. They're not. So are you going to identify from your three studies these things that, that will uh, give you some guidelines to improve? I think, th I think that will arise and I, th and I, I hope that that will be some information around that will become more available. But I think the challenge to begin with is probably around identifying anybody who says they work and provide support for children and young people. So certainly if I'm looking at current practice, asking people about how they support children and young people, then I think what I'm going to also get is um, some sense of what's missing in their practice. So if they're telling me, and, I, and I'll use an example, and, and uh, I spoke to, I was contacted by a police officer, and he wanted to make a referral, and he actually thought he was making a referral to the police. And he said to me, I just want to refer this on. And I said to him, that's fine, I'll give you their number. I said, but um, I think you need to know that in fact, as the local area command, and you become familiar with all this jargon when you work in the, in the sector, so you're from the LAC, you get to carry this matter. You maintain carriage of this matter. And he was a bit disconcerted by that, but anyway, he said, well, I still want to talk to the missing persons unit. I want to refer it on. I went, okay, he said, the family's very upset. I said to him, are there children in this family? And I knew the family he was talking about because in the early days there's often some media coverage. And he said, yes, there are, but I don't have time for this. I just want to refer it on. And so there's a missing practice because I think that there is a responsibility to respond at an early point for service providers to ask the questions about who's in this family, who's impacted, rather than Let's get rid of it and move on. So I think that it will identify some missing practices. I think it will also identify some perhaps mispractice, not malpractice, but mispractice, um, because people who come at responding to families from a solution-focused approach, rather than acknowledging the ambiguity of the situation, can send a message to the family that they're somehow not doing it the right way. Whereas we would say what's important is that, that those who are left behind have to find a way of living with ambiguity. It's not something that can be approached uh, from a solution-focused or problem-solving approach. So we very much look at um, a strengths-based approach and, uh, and we look at things like resilience, but I'm not looking at that here. I'm looking at how is it that the community currently responds, service providers currently respond to young people and to their families. Um, give, could you flesh out just a little bit about uh, the interview for study work <coughs> and how you're going to cope with, how you're going to deal with the data that you get from that? I. I mean, what, what's the content of the interview and then how are you going to uh, summarize or analyze that? Okay. I'm going to invite young people to tell their story. I do have some research questions that are around, very loosely around, tell me what this was like for you. Tell me what happened for you. So really it will be a very, um, I hope, a, a fairly supportive um, interview. I believe it will be a fairly supportive interview. That will be recorded, transcribed. I will be looking for emerging themes, some of which I anticipate will be common themes. 
but I'm also looking very much for an individual story, an individual description, um, and wanting down the track to affirm and validate the response of the young person. Okay. Uh, just following on that, uh, uh, you're working in that unit and you're in charge of what happens now. Uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, you're planning a, a structured interview. Are there structured interviews now? Or how does it work? Uh, um, we adhere to the, to the policy or the approach of starting where the client is at. What is it that is presented to us in, by the person who seeks our service? So I wouldn't call what we do now structured interviews. We certainly do a mini and ongoing assessment with people. So this will be a more conscious um, endeavour to elicit a story around what happened following the loved one going missing. In terms of, there are only three of us in the unit. So whilst I am the researcher, there are two others within the unit who are, in fact there's two and a bit other people, within the unit who will be able to provide, if needed, that ongoing emotional, psychological support for those who participate. Um, thank you. It's again a very interesting topic. Um, I had um, some questions about the design itself, about why, for instance, um, if you're talking about their experience, you wouldn't use like a phenomenological design, which is not my forte by long shot. But why would you not go with such a, a given, given that the experiences are usually located within that methodology? I'm not sure I understand how to answer that. Um, I want young people to use their words to describe their experience. Yes. There's not many of them. Well, there's not many who readily identify. So what I hope to do in those semi-structured interviews is invite them to say, tell me what this has been like for you. And I think because their experience is at times so disenfranchised, um, certainly we come across young people who when they do make contact with somebody who asks them, they want to tell. They want the opportunity to tell. But often they're not asked. What was this like for you? In the loop actually came from a young person. I want to be kept in the loop. Can I just add to that? In your sampling, um, you've talked about using um, uh, older people who were children at the time of the event mm. and children at the time of the event, mm. um, or young adults, I should say, young people. Um, I was wondering why you wouldn't choose something like a dyad, like a carer and a child, and, and actually do it that way rather than splitting them up into different samples. Mm -hmm. so that you got to hear that interaction or, you know, um, what, what both of them are perceiving about the situation, what they did about it, what they didn't do about it. Do you know, that's really interesting and it may be something that arises. You know, that, it, that the young person actually says, this is what I thought was happening, or the adult says, this is what I thought was happening for my young person. I think, though, the other thing we, we sort of know, or we do know, is that young people are as protective of their parents as ca and carers as the parents and carers are of them. So that whilst I think it's very important to open up the communication, and a dyad would do that, I think that there is some self-censorship that goes on around, around if I tell my mum, if I tell my dad, if I tell my auntie what's happening, it's going to upset her. 
And, and lastly, it sounds like a mi- it sort of presents like a mixed methods study, but you haven't used that terminology at all. I'm wondering whether you've done some reading in that area, or what did you all think about that? I have done some reading in the area, and and really just thought this is going to get me the rich description I want. Um, I thought the idea of having a focus group for parents and carers in some ways gives them permission to say, actually, I struggled with this, much more than they are likely to say um, on their own in, a, in, a, in an interview. Yeah. 